Hi folks and welcome back to the WTF and this evening we're talking about antennas for 160 meters and I've just put up a dipole for 160 meters and I thought I would share with you my pearls of wisdom on uh, antennas for this band and the specific challenges that you have to think about uh, for putting up a 160 meter antenna. Um, it's not a bad band actually 160 meters, a lot of people criticize it saying it's full of old men talking a load of old crap but uh, there are some uh, there are some pluses to it and uh, I did have an antenna up a couple of years ago I did double it for 160 meters but I took it down from the tower and put up my uh, 80 meter dipole instead because I tend to use 80 meters a lot these days so um, I thought I would go back on 160 and uh, see if we can get up an antenna anyway let's just let me just grab a pen and paper because I just want to share some thoughts on the different sorts of options we got and uh, yeah and also I'll also give you some uh, some some tips and tricks for this uh, dipole antenna that I sort of um, have discovered over the years having put up a number of dipoles and sort of give you share with you some uh, some ideas on that anyhow let's uh, let's grab a piece of paper and then we'll, we'll uh, take you through the options so when it comes to 160 meters, what are the options? And I've scribbled down something here on my piece of paper. And this is my own experience uh, with these type of antennas and some of the tips and tricks, I guess, um, of these aerials. So let's start with the dipole antenna. Now the dipole is uh, quite a basic aerial, um, but it works uh, remarkably well. And you can either have these either as a sort of resonant aerial where you have the feeder either with coax, in other words, unbalanced. And the usual setup here is you put a, a, a ballon. Alternatively, you can, have, you can make this into a doublet and feed this with ladder line and uh, you've got a, a, a tunable aerial system which you, know, you can cover several bands. And I've, I, I originally tried a doublet. Um, in fact I had a doublet on top of the uh, 60 foot tower and it seemed to work actually uh, for, for 160 meters it worked um, it worked very well. You know the traditional teaching with a dipole um, a dipole in free space, I'm sure some of you have seen these diagrams a dipole tends to radiate when it's up in at least higher than a quarter of a wavelength it, it has this sort of figure of eight uh, pattern and it does have, you know, when it's in this sort of situation, you do have very good directivity and you have pretty good gain for a basic air, air antenna system. And when we look at it, uh, when you look at the radiation pattern in the um, sort of vertical plane, you'll find that it has, again, if it's reasonably high off the ground, it has a reasonably good uh, takeoff angle. In other words, it's not too high and it's not too low, so it, it works pretty well for um, local QSOs and also uh, for you know more DX stuff. Now the problem with a dipole on 160 meters, for a dipole to get this sort of configuration or radiation pattern, you're going to have to have this dipole up at least 40 meters, a quarter of a wavelength on uh, 160 meters. Um, so that's actually quite, you know, that's actually quite a difficult challenge. What tends to happen is that when you have a, a dipole that's sort of more close to the ground, you tend to get this sort of radiation pattern. In other words, you have a quite a, a high um, angle of, of uh, radiation. So the radiation tends to go up, which is what, which is quite good if you want a Nevis antenna you know near vertical instant sky wave so so this type of arrangement is actually quite good for um, you know into G or into locate locality um, so that you know that's that, that 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 from that point of view it works okay but having said that the dipole the doublet I had up worked pretty well for both in fact I used to regularly get QSOs across the pond with a doublet up at 60 foot but even 60 foot is a long way and a lot of people would struggle to get an antenna up that high unless you've got a tower. 
So those are the pros and cons of a, a dipole. A vertical antenna is an option on 160 meters, but again, it's it's the challenge. You know, ideally it needs to be a quarter wavelength long, and it's it's a huge. You know, a, a vertical of that sort of height is is massive. So you've got very sort of engineering and constructional constraints. But it can be done, and you can actually have a shortened uh, vertical where you have what's called capacitive loading. So you put some wires on the top here, and then you can effectively um, make the make the antenna shorter. Um, but electrically, it, it would it appears you know to be like a quarter wave. So that's an alternative way of doing it. And, and obviously, with a vertical, you're going to get low angle radiation, so it's it's going to be good for long distance. I haven't tried a a vertical uh, for 160 meters. Um, well, so, so some, nothing sort of close to a quarter wave. I have tried uh, a T-shaped antenna. Uh, it's what they call a Marconi antenna where you basically have a vertical and section with a T on the top which acts as a bit of loading and my experience with that was it was uh, for, for inter G work it was it was pretty mediocre I would say a dipole would, was about 10 or 15 dB stronger than a, a T-shaped antenna or a top loaded vertical but again you know for, for long distance work that would work very well and it's all everything's a bit of a trade-off, you see. That's the problem with with 160 meters. You've got to decide what what you want to do. Do you want to do local work, or do you want to do DX, or do you do you want to? Or, or, uh, ideally, you you probably want to do a bit of both. So you want something that's reasonably flexible. But nothing is nothing. You know, if there's a compromise, it won't be perfect. One antenna will be good for one form of communication. You know, local work, and and one will be best for DX. And you you have to really decide what you want which moves quite nicely onto the inverted L which is a quite a good antenna and it is probably the best compromise antenna because this type of antenna uh, on 160 meters you're going to you have the vertical um, advantage of being able to offer you some low angle radiation for DX work and the horizontal component as well which also radiates that's the way this works uh, would also um, provide some horizontal uh, polarized uh, radiation which uh, will be good for um, into G work. Now I've tried an inverted L, I had one between my two masts and uh, I wasn't that, well I mean for local stuff you know when I used to want to talk to stations in the UK I found it it didn't perform um, anywhere near as well as the doublet which was quite high up and um, the other but it but on for dx it did actually work and what it was actually quite interesting because when i first put this aerial up i think one of the first qso's i had was a station in las vegas and i actually had to look twice and said no that's not possible 160 meters uh las vegas in the usa and it, you know I, I didn't believe it but then i did um i actually received a qsl card from him and that uh it was a genuine uh qso the problem with the inverted l is that it's a lot of work you know to get this to work properly you're going to have to put a ground system in because the way this works is that it's it's basically uh, <clears throat> you, you have to have a good ground system and the other thing that you need very often with a inverted L is that you generally feed it via a, a capacitor which usually has to be a vacuum capacitor or something pretty strong or pretty meaty and uh, you know that has to be at the base of the antenna and so you've got to figure figure that figure that out how you're going to do that um you can probably tune it uh using a motor you know and then have a power supply or something in the shack so to, to to tune it remotely um but i i thought about an inverted l i was almost tempted to put one up and in fact i may put one up at a later stage but it's um you know it, it is a bit more work you've got to put radials down and you know when you're looking at 160 meters the radials are going to be longer and you can you know i think you'd probably get away with just a couple the other way some people do run this aerial as well is with the single what they call a counterpoise where the air where the counterpoise is not is basically isolated uh, from earth and runs 
you know sort of just above the ground and that and you can you can you can do it like that and that sometimes works and saves you sort of messing around with radials if we move on to the other number four which is other and, and i've just sort of just briefly talked about these these are sort of loaded you know things like loaded dipoles um and shortened antennas of various description descriptions shortened verticals the problem with all these sort of things is that um because they're shortened shortened aerials they become inefficient so yes you can put loading coils in uh things like that uh you know to to reduce the physical size of the aerial but at the end of the day you will be losing um um, RF in the form of heat in, in, in all these coils so the antenna system does become inefficient but you know if you're desperate to put a signal out you know it's something to consider especially you know if you haven't got much space and the last section there which I've put is basically MAD which <laughs> um, and the MAD section is for um, truly crazy antennas uh, which I have tried and uh, under this category I would include my rhombic which I put up here um, several years ago um, which was um, I think it was had um, let me try and remember about it was about 600 or 300 meters yeah 300 meters on each side of the rhombic it was all diamond shaped and I fed it with ladder line and it didn't really work brilliantly it was a lot of effort to put up but it was pretty mediocre and although it was you could tune it uh, to the higher frequencies on 160 meters it really didn't work um, it certainly didn't outperform the dipole antenna and uh, the reason for that is it comes back to the old problem it's just not high enough I managed to get this thing about 12 meters high on average in most parts you know where I strung it up in trees and things like that um, one of the things where I live you know space isn't is not a problem you know luckily I, my, my next door neighbor's a farmer and you know he lets me put air, you know aerials up as long as they don't interfere with the cows it, you know it's not a problem but he hasn't got many tall trees and I haven't got many tall trees so my issue is not space it's height and if you can get a rhombic up the reasonable height you know average say 60 foot uh, at each point then you'll have a fantastic antenna but um, you know I I tried it and it was a bit disappointing because simply it's not high enough and um, the other thing that some people do as well, which I also included in the MAD category, are, are things like, which I've heard people on, on the radio, you know, making doublets where you make extended length doublets and dipoles and things like that, which are perfectly reasonable to do. Um, and there is, well, theoretically, they do give you a little bit more gain. Um, are they worth it? Um, well, it's, you can try it. I remember one chap on 160 had a doublet which had each length was something like each arm of the doublet was about a hundred and was about a kilometer or something silly and he reckoned this antenna works really well um, but uh, maybe he had it up higher you know had the height uh, the other crazy antenna which I know from experience was, was my old friend G3 LYW who used to be a big signal on top band he's now SK but he, he, his aerial that he used to use on 160 meters was a full wave, um, off center fed. I think it was sort of fed with a, with a, um, ladder line or something like that. And he used to use that sort of um, bit, bit of a crazy antenna. But again, it used to be strung up between, you know, really tall trees, and and that, and that antenna, you know, was really good for him. Um, it so. If there's one lesson I would say, you know, whatever antenna you use on 160, if you're not going vertical uh, and horizontal antennas, I'm talking about, you've got to have the height. Otherwise, you'll be doing what they call cloud warming, which if you're wanting to talk to, to your mates in the same country might just fit the job. And if you can get it up reasonably high, you will, you know, with a horizontal antenna, which are generally a bit easier to construct. Uh, you will be able to work some DX and it will work pretty well. So that's the reason why I've gone for 
uh, a dipole on this occasion and I'll just show you a little bit more about that in a minute. So we're at the back of the uh, shack at the moment and the sun is going down actually it's been a quite nice day today and this actually works quite well because the antenna is kind of like silhouetted in the in the uh, in the light at the moment because of the uh, it's it's uh, it's just around about dusk anyhow let's just take a look at this for a minute this is the uh, this is my tenor mast just to orientate you that's the uh, that's the main tower with the Yagi and then this tenor mast I put up actually before the tower and you can buy these they're quite good actually this one's actually oops try and get it this one is 12 meters high and I've actually added a stub mast onto it to make it a bit higher I had to do that in order to uh, get the height and I'll show you how I did that in a minute so this this tenor master is got a nice little winch a tilt over thing and this is my dipole that I've put up I've wrapped some uh, coax there which sort of acts as a bit of a choke uh, I'm not quite sure how effective it is and this dipole is goes over to that mast over there which is a bit bendy but it does seem to be it does seem to stay up probably ought to put a guy wire on that it's bending a bit and then I just pop over here and just look through these bushes uh, you can probably just can't just about see it over yeah it's a bit difficult to see but over there there's a there's another mast so this is a a uh, full half wave dipole uh, up at about um, what 13 or 14 meters hello I'm just going to show you the dipole center that I use for dipoles uh, I mean you can make your own it's not that difficult but if you're not uh, if you don't want the hassle and you want to just buy one of these uh, <clears throat> dipole centers uh, there's, there's a few of them on um, on eBay and I've tried most of them and to be honest with you they most of these work pretty well I mean there's not much to go wrong with a, um, a dipole center uh, I got this from uh, Nevada radio and I've used these before and they're pretty good actually uh, just some just show you some of the uh, features on these which you know actually make these quite handy first of all well the main enemy of any form of <clears throat> air dwell well particularly a dipole because you have to realize that with a dipole antenna you know part of the um uh, braid on the coax has to go to one side and then the center conductor goes to the other and effectively <clears throat> you in order to do that you've obviously got to break the coax you've got to strip it and you've got to somehow you know connect each side of the dipole to the uh, various parts of the coax and the, the inherent problem with that is obviously you know there's always a potential for water ingress and water is a real killer for um, <clears throat> anything that's well coax in general because once co once you get water inside the coax it's a nightmare and you, and you end up having to replace it so uh, when I've what I've tended to do that's what I've tended to buy these um, dipole centers rather than make my own because because of, uh, I want something that's basically not going to get wet and also, is also <clears throat> quite sturdily built and these things you know fit the uh, description fairly well <clears throat> these things are all stainless steel which is you need because um, everything just rusts certainly around here um, you probably might get away with it if you're in you know, the Nevada desert or somewhere like that um, or Arizona desert but uh, in Swansea um, everything uh, rusts and anything made of metal 
in this part of the world. Uh, even non-ferrous materials seem to rust. Everything rusts here. Uh, so um, <clears throat> you've got to make sure that um, you know it's, it's stainless steel. And these things are quite sturdy. The other thing I like about them are these things, which um, they take the tension off. I'll just get in the centre of the picture. They take the tension off the uh, the wire, which works quite well. And then you've got some. They usually come with some um, sort of spade, um, eye crimp connectors or solder tags, whatever you want to call them, to solder your uh, wire on. So. Uh, so these things work pretty well. The other thing what I do, and the other trick of the trade when it comes to dipoles, which I want to show you, is waterproofing. So as I mentioned, uh, everything uh, around here tends to rust, and, you don't, and the other problem is you don't want to get water in the coax. So if we look at this, just get it in focus. You've obviously got a threaded uh, connection there, an SO259. And you don't want uh, you don't want water getting in there. And what I've tended to use over the years is this stuff, Denso tape, and I think this is used by plumbers for sort of waterproofing pipe connections. And it really is quite obnoxious stuff in the sense that it's very sticky. It's all like greasy. You can see that there. It's got you cut strips of this off. It's it's not terribly expensive. You can buy it or buy it on uh, buy it on eBay fairly fairly cheaply. Just move that out of the way. Um, but you ba basically, yeah, you, you 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 basically cut off bits of this and then uh, wrap it around the the uh, the coax, the the PL two five nine. What I generally do is put a, like in, insulate it with standard insulation tape, one layer, and then I've, I've just put uh, this Denso tape on. Uh, several pieces and so you'll wrap it round and then you 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 massage in the um the greasy stuff which which had which is incorporated in the tape and i can tell you that that you won't get any water in any of your connectors if you use denso tape it is really um the best stuff to use for waterproofing uh connectors if you just use that self amalgamating rubber stuff that i i find i that stuff's not bad but i found that even that um it does tend to um, let water in as well, but for things like dipoles, uh, where you've got to plug in connector or a ballon or something like that, which has got a, um, a, a connector, an RF connector, then Denso tape is definitely the way to go, and you can use that on any 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 antenna. So I thought I would just share that with you.